Tonight on Y News. Filipinos in Iraq, Iran, and Lebanon are ordered to return to the Philippines after highest threat alert was raised and amid rising U.S.-Iran tensions. The Armed Forces of the Philippines prepares their air assets and landing ships to rescue Filipinos from Iran and Iraq. The Philippine government allocates 1.8 billion pesos for the mass repatriation of overseas Filipino workers from the Middle East. A UNTV exclusive, a Filipino in Iraq shares how he prepares or is preparing for the worst case scenario if the situation in the Middle East further escalates. And road closures and rerouting begins tonight in Manila City for the yearly traslacion in Quiapo. Good evening. Filipinos living and working in the Middle East are advised to coordinate with the Philippine government for repatriation assistance. Meanwhile, OFWs in Iraq, Iran, and Lebanon are ordered to return to the Philippines after highest threat alert was raised amid rising U.S.-Iran tensions. Dante Amento tells us why. Several national government officials will soon head for the Middle East to facilitate the repatriation of Filipino workers there. Philippine Overseas Employment Administration Administrator Bernard Olalia will head for Lebanon. Overseas Workers Welfare Administration Administrator Hans Leo Kakdak will go to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. An Undersecretary Claro Arillano will fly to the United Arab Emirates. Uh, they will bring with them the RRT or the Rapid Response Team so that they could immediately brief our OFWs there of the situation and the action that our department together with the other department will take in order to ensure a, a well-coordinated and safe repatriation of our OFWs. Filipinos who want to evacuate or go to the base camp in Saudi Arabia may coordinate with the Philippine government through the Crisis Management Committee hotline. Even their relatives can make inquiries through the Dolly hotline 1349 and OWA hotline 1348. From the base camp, some Filipinos will be transported to the Philippines. Others will be temporarily brought to the other countries like Japan, China, Russia or Germany because of the huge number of Filipinos to be repatriated. They are advised to coordinate with DOLE, OWA, or POEA for the repatriation assistance. Secretary Bellu adds that more than 2.1 million Filipinos are expected to be evacuated from countries like Jordan, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Oman, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates if a full-scale war occurs. The Philippine government's advice to Filipinos in those countries is to evacuate voluntarily if the situation in their areas worsens. Apart from documented OFWs, Bellu is also concerned about those undocumented. Secretary Bellu further says a full deployment ban of Filipino workers to Iraq, Iran, and Lebanon will be implemented soon. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue. President Rodrigo Duterte seems to be not inclined to sending troops to Iran. He adds that such decision does not depend on him. Meanwhile, the Budget Department assures there will be enough funds for the mass repatriation of Filipino workers from the Middle East. Rosalie Cos explains why. It is President Rodrigo Duterte himself who said that though the Philippines has a long-standing alliance with the United States of America, this does not mean the country has to send military troops to assist the U.S. in its conflict with Iran. According to the chief executive, sending Filipino troops for the looming battle does not depend on his decision. Unless uh, the national interest would demand it, and it will be decided not by me, but me and Congress. The president adds the defense treaty between the Philippines and America cannot be invoked amid the ongoing U.S.-Iran conflict. According to President Duterte, he will not let American forces use the Philippines as its launching pad. However, the chief executive said that American gray ships may still dock for refueling. We will continue to respect it in transit. But uh, 
to use the Philippines as a launching pad for to fly the missiles and the rockets. And I do not think that I have to stop them. As for the safe repatriation of almost 2 million Filipinos working in the Middle East, in case tension escalates, a huge amount of money is needed. Based on estimates, around 1,600 Filipinos are in Iran, 6,000 in Iraq, and around a million Filipino migrants in Saudi Arabia. Located 1.8 billion pesos according for the to the Department of which came even before the announcement of President Duterte that he wants all Filipinos evacuated from the region due to the conflict. In fact, we have provided in the budget already, even without that, we have already funds for the repatriation of our Filipino overseas workers. 1.29 billion in the DFA budget. We also have an allocation of 100 million in the OWA budget. And we have also some funds that we can tap under the OWA fund. In case these funds are not enough, DBM ensures the government can tap other funds for the repatriation ordered by President Duterte. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. The repatriation of Filipino workers from Iran and Iraq will begin soon. The Department of National Defense awaits a documentation from the Foreign Affairs Department to begin the execution of the planned evacuation of Filipinos affected by the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. Lea Ilagan tells us why. The Department of National Defense is now preparing for the repatriation of Filipinos in the Middle East, particularly in Iran and Iraq. The DND will deploy two landing ships with 500 capacity each, two C-130 planes and one C-295 aircraft for the repatriation of the OFWs. The Armed Forces of the Philippines or AFP will also deploy two combat forces consisting of Army and Marine Battalions to help the repatriation. Ang idea ni Presidente is uh, magpadala tayo doon just in case na kailangan ng mga tao natin ng protection. The two battalions will not be there to uh, engage in combat with anybody but to uh, facilitate or uh, help assist in the repatriation of the OFWs, especially in Iraq, hindi sila magpunta doon para magkipaglaban. Lorenzana says they will also consider renting cruise ships with 3,000 capacity and a commercial plane if a large number of OFWs wants to come home. The official adds Philippine Coast Guard ship BRP Gabriela Silang will be en route to the Middle East to help the evacuation. BRP Gabriela Silang came from France and was supposed to be delivered to the Philippines. The ship is now docked at a Maltop free port and will head to Oman and Dubai to be used as shuttle from Iran and Iraq to Qatar. The DND secretary is also worried about the safety of OFWs who want to stay in their jobs despite the ongoing conflict. Uh, ito kasi yung challenge eh, because some, pe some Filipinos do not want to leave their job kasi sabi na ang ano gagawin natin sa Pilipinas but uh, hopefully we will be able to convince them kung medyo delikado yung buhay nila to come home. The DND is now waiting for the documentation of the Foreign Affairs Department to begin the repatriation of Filipino workers from Iran and Iraq. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue, Camp Aguinaldo. The Department of the Interior and Local Government has been tasked to ensure that assistance needed by Filipino workers to be repatriated from the Middle East will be given. The Interior, the Interior Secretary admits, however, that one of the challenges in their repatriation efforts are the Filipinos who do not want to come home to the Philippines. Arlene Delgado explains why. Is now working on the repatriation of thousands of Filipinos in the Middle East affected by the rising tensions between the United States and Iran. Because of this, President Rodrigo Duterte has ordered the interior and local government to ensure that local government units will provide assistance to all returning Filipinos in their respective areas. I am uh, directing all the uh, local government units, the local chief executives, to provide assistance and accommodate our returning OFWs. They are displaced, uh, untimely ang pag-uwi nila, so dapat tulungan natin sila. 
Secretary Eduardo Año is a member of the committee formed by the president to lead the evacuation efforts of Filipinos who were caught between the U.S.-Iran conflict. Lahat ng po pwede maibigay natin assistance dyan, you know, uh, as far as the national government is concerned. But of course, uh, the president uh, gave a word na even if financial ay magbibigay siya. The secretary adds they will also ensure the safety of Filipinos who do not want to come home to the Philippines. Especially kung Iranian or Iraqi citizens yung kanilang mga spouses, so we have to respect kung anong gusto nila. But we have to make sure na they're also safe. For Lynn Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue, Camp Krame. Several roads in Manila City will be closed in preparation for the annual procession in, Quiapo, in the Capo area. Authorities remind motorists to take note of the rerouting plan as devotees are expected to flop beginning tonight. The Jones Bridge must be avoided tomorrow. Bernard Dadis reports why. The route of the annual Traslacion will be a little shorter this year with only 6.19 kilometers compared to the previous 6.19 kilometers. It will avoid the Jones Bridge and instead take the Ayala Bridge. Several roads will be temporarily closed beginning 9 p.m. today based on the traffic management plan. These include the southbound lane of Bonifacio Drive from Anda Circle to Katigbak Drive. Ross Boulevard, north and southbound lanes from Katigbak to UN Avenue. The north and southbound lanes of Maria Orosa from TM Kalo to P. Burgos. The north and southbound lanes of Tap Avenue from TM Kalo to Ayala Boulevard. Romualdez from UN Avenue to Ayala Boulevard. The stretch of P. Castle Street from C. Palanca to San Rafael. Palanca Street from Plaza Lacson to Quiapo Ilalim. Southbound lane of Quezon Boulevard from Furgoso Street to Quezon Bridge and the westbound lane of Espana Boulevard from P. Campa to Lerma Street. As for the alternate routes, vehicles from Rizal Avenue going to Loton Intramuros and the Pier Zone area must take Das Marina Street or go straight to the MacArthur Bridge, turn right to Magallanes Bridge Drive Extension and turn right to Jones Bridge. Vehicles from Jose Abad Santos Reina Gente going to Intramuros shall take one luna, turn left to Plaza Cervantes, right to Jones Bridge, then to Magallanes Drive. Vehicles traveling southbound of Mel Lopez Boulevard or R10 going to Rojas Boulevard may turn left to Moriones Street, then go straight to Dagupan Street. Light vehicles traveling northbound of Taft Avenue going to Quiapo Santa Cruz area shall turn right to UN Avenue, then go straight to Pas Guanzon and turn left to the Mabini Bridge. Vehicles traveling northbound of Rojas, Mabini and Maria Orosa Ginto to Pier Zone Binondo de Visoria area may turn right to UN Avenue, then go straight to Pas Guanzon and left to the Mabini Bridge. Vehicles coming from Quezon City passing through the southbound lane of Espana Avenue may turn right to P. Campa Street, then turn left to A. Mendoza Street, right to Fugoso Street, turn left to Rizal Avenue or turn left to Nicanor Reyes Street, turn right to C. M. Recto Avenue. Vehicles coming from Ligarda Street may turn right to C. M. Recto Avenue. Vehicles coming from the northern part of Manila intending to use Rojas Boulevard may pass through the Kapulong Tayuman A.H. Lacson Nagtahan Flyover going to the Mabini Bridge. Light vehicles coming from southern part of Manila utilizing Rojas Boulevard going north shall turn right to UN Avenue, straight to Pas Guanzon, left to the Mabini Bridge, then to Nagtahan Flyover to a A.H. Lacson to the point of destination. Heavy vehicles like trucks coming from the south area may take President Osmeño Road going to President Carino, then to the Mabini Bridge, go straight to Nagtahan Flyover via A.H. Lacson to Kapulong and vice versa. Bernard Dadis, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. The National Capital Region Police Office or NCRPO and the National Telecommuni Telecommunications Commission or NTC have asked the two major local telecommunications companies to suspend mobile phone services 
in select areas during the yearly traslacion in Quiapo being observed by the Catholic community in the country. In a memorandum, the NCRPO and the NTC directed the Smart Communications Inc. and Globe Telecom to temporarily shut down services starting on January 8 at 11 p.m. until 12 noon on January 10 in select areas. In compliance to the directive, Smart Communications posted an, posted an advisory on Facebook stating areas which will be affected by the temporary network service shutdown. The company assured its subscribers that services will be restored as soon as it gets a go signal from authorities. Globe Telecom also advised that customers, its customers that there will be temporary loss of signal in some parts of the city of Manila and other neighboring areas. The translation event held every January 9 draws hundreds of thousands of Catholic devotees in Quiapo and during hours of walk for the procession. More than 13,000 police officers will be deployed to the event to ensure the peaceful and orderly conduct of their procession. Authorities have also implemented a suspension of permit to carry firearms outside of residence in Manila starting 8 a.m. Jan January 7 until 8 a.m. January 10. The gun ban covers Quiapo, Santa Cruz, and Binondo areas in Manila. Welcome back to Y News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. I am William Theo, and here are the headlines. UN TV exclusive, a Filipino in Iraq shares how he prepares for the worst-case scenario if the situation in Iraq escalates. Over 1,500 Filipinos in Iraq are ready for preemptive evacuations, according to Special Envoy to the Middle East, Secretary Roy Simatu. Vice President Leni Robredo reminds administration officials that the numbers in her drug report came from the Philippine National Police. Ancas admits violation of test run guidelines amid possible blacklist. And Maralco rates to go down this month. Good evening. Amid the rising tensions in Iraq, UNTV News got an exclusive interview with an overseas Filipino worker to know their current situation there. According to him, their status as of now is normal, but he is also preparing to evacuate if the situation deteriorates. Mirasol Abogadil details this exclusive report. The Philippine government has ordered the mandatory repatriation of some 6,000 Filipinos living in Iraq after two bases in Al-Assad and Erbil containing United States troops were attacked by Iran yesterday. Alex Eduarte, 43 years old, lives in Iraq and works as a service manager in a car company there. He just got transferred to Salaimaniya from his previous assignment in Erbil in the Kurdistan region. According to Eduarte, the situation in Sulaimaniya, which is three hours away from Erbil, remains normal. Eduarte adds he is now in close coordination with the Philippine Embassy in Baghdad as part of his preparations in case the situation in the country worsens and he needs to be repatriated. Luckily, his home is near the airport, which will make it easy for him to move out of Iraq if the need arises. According to Eduarte, whose hometown is in Laguna, due to the frequent missile attacks, Filipinos in Iraq and Iran are somewhat used to the tensions. In 2014, Eduarte and his co-workers were evacuated by their company as offensive forces fought the terrorist ISIS in the Kurdistan region. He can describe the situation before as worse than it is now. DOFW says the Philippine consulate regularly advises the Filipino community in Iraq of the situation there and that the evacuation plan is clear to them. Ang huling aviso po nila ay uh, magmatsyag dito sa Sulaymaniya. Kung may 
pagbabagong magaganap ay i-report po agad sa kanila. Mm-hmm. Tapos yung katulad ng contingency plan nila nung nakar- nakaraan na uh, ISIS, uh, yung ulit ang gagawin. Papasalamat lang po kasi kay President Duterte sa certification niya tapos po sa mga pinapakita niya po na talagang concern siya sa aming mga OFW. Nararamdaman naman po namin yun. Mira Sol Abugadil, UNTV News and Rescue. Meanwhile, alert level 4 has been raised in Iraq, which means a forced or mandatory evacuation will be executed by the Philippine government. Many Filipinos may refuse to be brought back home to the Philippines, but they may be forced to do so. Ray Pelayo will explain why. Bringing home Filipinos affected by the conflict in the Middle East may not be an easy task. Nonetheless, the Philippine government vows to make all efforts to carry out the evacuation. According to Environment Secretary and Philippine Special Envoy to the Middle East, Roy Simatu, 1,592 Filipino workers in Iraq are ready for preemptive evacuation. They will be traveled from Baghdad to Jordan and from there they will head for Dubai and then fly to Manila. The Philippine flag will be placed on the vehicle to be used by the Filipinos for identification and to avoid being attacked by any forces. Dubai will be the central logistic base due to the frequency of flights in the area. Simato says the repatriation of Filipinos from U.S. military bases in the Middle East should be done immediately. Sir, kung alimbawa uh, hindi sila sumama dun sa repatriation, yung mga Pilipino, uh, ito po yung mandatory evacuation. Oo, pipilitin namin. Lalo na si Iraq, pipilitin namin. Sir? Nagawa na namin ito kasi ayaw talaga nila umalis because ano, ano sabi, kapit alingan sa amin, antal na makonvince sa amin because akala nila kasi they don't know yet the difficulties kasi doon. Pero kung this is a force of equation, we have to force them really. There are more than 1,000 Filipinos in Iran. Most of them are married to Iranian nationals. Simato says the Filipinos can bring their spouses if the Iranian government allows it. Each embassy in the Middle East has its own contingency plan to execute in case the alert level in their respective areas are raised to level 4. Secretary Simatu is scheduled to leave for the Middle East tomorrow at 1 p.m. from Naia Terminal 1. His first destination is Qatar. From there, he will try to enter Iraq and other states where repatriation of OFWs is needed. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Gazon City. Meanwhile, the rift between the United States and Iran is worsening. Many Filipinos are worried if the conflict will have an effect on the prices of petroleum products and prime commodities in the country. Find out if the oil prices will be affected by the U.S.-Iran tension as Mon Hokson reports. Iran is one of the biggest oil producers in the world. And with the worsening tension between the United States and Iran, it definitely has an effect on the prices of petroleum products. But the question of many Filipinos, are we affected here in the Philippines? The response of the Department of Energy, yes, but not for now. In fact, prices of gasoline go down yesterday. But if the tension in the Middle East will escalate, DOE said, we need to prepare for the worst. And then, si Iran kasi napaka-strategic location niya. Lalo na dun sa dadaanan ng ating mga vessel o ng mga barges, yung Strait of Hormuz. If you will notice in the past na once na nagkaroon ng threat, yun ang target nilang sarhan. But why don't we just store more oil? We can, but according to the Energy Department, we need a huge amount of budget and larger facility. Currently, we have oil reserves, but it will only last for a few months. Unlike the United States, China, Japan, and Russia that can store for a year. DOE said a large percentage of oil imported by the Philippines came from the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and Oman, which are allied nations of the United States. The department is hoping that Iran will not turn their anger to these countries because it will have a great effect in the Philippines. Economist Wilson Lee Flores said China might talk with Iran regarding the effect 
of the war with the economy. Um, yun daw kaibigan ng Iran, yung matalik na kaibigan nila, Russia and China. Yun sumusuport na sa ekonomiya nila, di ba? Ayaw, alam ko, ayaw ng China ng gulo. Kasi pag gulo, walang negosyo. Masama ang negosyo ng mundo. Flores said that the Philippines is still lucky because of our growing economy. Even there is a growing tension in the Middle East, we can still manage to move on because of our new infrastructures. The DOE assures that no oil company will take advantage of the situation to increase prices. Walang karapatan ba sa si oil company na mag-adjust kung wala talagang trigger kasi alam ng DOE yun. The government is prepared to stop the implementation of the third tranche of the excise tax if oil price will spike. Mon Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue. Manila Electric Company or Maralco announces that the electricity rate it charges its customers will reduce this month. Meralco's overall rates dropped to 41 centavos per kilowatt hour. This means that if a typical household consuming 200 kilowatt hour a month could expect that their electric bill will decrease by 82 pesos. 123 pesos reduction for every 300 kilowatt hour. 164 pesos for 400 kilowatt hour consumption and 205 pesos decline for every 500 kilowatt hour usage of electricity. The reduction was primarily due to lower power costs from its suppliers, the power distributor firm said. In other news, suspended San Fernando City La Union Mayor Hermenegildo Dong Gualberto announced today he is stepping down from his position. In an official statement posted on his Facebook page, Gualberto said he is stepping down after the office of the Ombudsman imposed the penalty of dismissal against him. He insisted he did not do anything wrong and added that he will bring his case to a higher court. The Office of the Ombudsman issued a preventive suspension order against Gualberto in May 2019 due to the alleged misuse of local government funds. The Commission on Audit has reviewed the government's national greening program. It has found that not even 50%, not even 20% of its target land area to be planted with seedlings was reached. The Commission recommends that the Department of Environment and Natural Resources execute the program properly but not in a hurry. Ray Pelayo tells us why. The National Greening Program or NGP was launched in 2011 by the Aquino Administration. The NGP is a government priority program to reduce poverty promote food security, environmental stability and biodiversity, and enhance climate change mitigation and adaptation. The program seeks to plant 1.5 billion seedlings in 1.5 million hectares of public lands nationwide in six years from 2011 to 2016. Based on the Commission on Audit or COAS Validation Report released in December 2019, only around 12% of the targeted forest land was planted with seedling under the NGP. COA also found, based on its report, that the government's strategy was inappropriate because the manpower did not sustain the magnitude of the program. Many plant species did not survive because they were not cared for properly, while agroforestry species like a cow remain. COA says there are only around 7 million hectares of forest land in 2019 or 41.5% of the forest land back in 1934 or about 86 years ago. The current Department of Environment and Natural Resources or DNR does not want to point fingers to the previous administration. DNR Undersecretary Benny Antiporda says they are sure to take the necessary measures to exit the program and achieve its objectives. Magkakaroon ng impounding area for water and soil no? para lang sa pangangailangan nitong mga NGP natin. These are the preparations na hindi nila nakita noon. The core report says, though reforestation is an immediate concern, the DNR should not be in a hurry to implement the program. The DNR subscribes to such recommendation. Per Yusek Antiporda, they are now considering a community-based program. Ngayon ho, community-based tayo. Itong community na to, ilang hektarya kaya niya, doon tayo. Hindi ho sa pilitan niya ang gagawin na yun. 
Antiporda says one of the species to plant is bamboo because it grows easily. Ang pinakamalaking problema talaga is yung maraming hindi nag-survive. No? Bakit hindi nag-survive? Yung uh, wrong timing of uh, planting, uh, tapos yung uh, wrong species, and, and at the same time, of course, yung climate change natin. No? Koa also recommends the use of drone for a clear picture of land areas to plant in. Ripilayo, UNTV, Use and Rescue, Quezon City. Welcome back to iNews. The remains of Filipino worker Jeneline Villavende arrived in the country today. The Philippine Overseas Employment Administration confirms the suspension of Villavende's local recruitment agency through its license has not been suspended. Aiko Miguel explains why. The remains of Janeline Villavende, a Filipino worker who died in Kuwait, arrived in the Philippines at past 4 this afternoon through Kuwait Airlines 417. Her loved ones were there during the arrival. Villavende's body will be flown to General Santos City tomorrow. From there, the family will travel home to Norala, South Cotabato with officials from the Foreign Affairs Department and the Overseas Workers' Welfare Administration. According to OWA Administrator Hans Leo Kakdak, Janeline's body will undergo autopsy to be conducted by forensic experts from the National Bureau of Investigation. The family has received death and burial benefits for Janelin. Avelardo Villavende, the OFW's father, has received livelihood assistance, while a lifetime scholarship grant has been provided by OWA to Janelin's sister, Athena Marie, who is now a grade 6 student. On Friday, Secretary Bellio, together with some local officials, will visit Villavende's wake in South Cotabato. The wake will last for two weeks. Duck Duck further says they are still on talks with the Kuwaiti government regarding the establishment of a special contract for the protection of Filipino workers in the Gulf state. Alam naman natin na may merong May 2018 agreement between Philippines and Kuwait. However, merong usapin tungo sa pagkakaroon ng standard contract sa nalalaman nins ana yung May 2018 agreement. Ang sabi ng Kuwait ay gusto na lamang nila isang kontrata para sa lahat ng nationality. So tayo ay hindi nagsumasang ayon doon. Gusto natin na may kontrata talaga na bukod tangi na talagang nakaangkla doon sa May 2018 agreement. Meanwhile, the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration or POEA confirms the suspension of the operations of Janeline's local recruitment agency last January 2. According to POEA Administrator Bernard Olalia, Villavendez Recruitment Agency has admitted they failed to monitor Janeline's complaints about her employer's bidding and not giving her salary. Sinuspindi na natin sila. So pinatawag natin sila at pinag explain kung uh, anong nangyari. So inamin naman nila na hindi sila nakapag nakapagbigay ng monitoring report. And that's the reason why there was a disciplinary action imposed upon the agency. Despite the suspension, the recruitment agency's license is not yet cancelled for now. Olalia clarifies investigation on the agency continues. We're still awaiting for the recommendation of the appropriate administrative case that will be filed, if ever there is any, against the said uh, agency. A partial deployment ban of Filipino domestic workers to the Gulf state is strictly being implemented until Janeline's employers are formally charged and brought to justice. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. Many have reacted that the report of Vice President Lenny Robredo on the government's anti-drug campaign is unfair, but the country's second top official rebuts. Vincent Arboleda tells us why. Vice President Lenny Robredo defended her report on the government's anti-drug campaign. She insists the data she has gathered were derived from official reports of member agencies of the Interagency Committee on Anti-Illegal Drugs or ICAD. VP Robredo said the 1% mark, which became the basis to conclude that supply constriction of the anti-drug campaign is a failure, is not invented. The data, she explains, came from the Philippine National Police as presented to her on a report during her stint as ICAD co-chairperson. Sinabi ng PNP na ito yung estimate nila. Kung mali yung estimate na yun, dapat kinorect ng PDEA. Wala naman silang ginawa. Wala silang ginawang correction. Kung hindi nila yun i-correct, gusto sabihin, hindi yun yung tinatanggap na data ng ICAD. The country's second top leader also responded to remarks that her report is unfair. 
VP Robredo said the report commends several agencies and their programs that yielded positive results and found to be effective. But the report also contains programs that should be abolished or changed as supported by data gathered from ICAD member agencies. Sana basahin yung buong report. Kasi yung buong report naman um, exhaustive kahit nga 18 days lang tayo sa ICAD, talagang wala tayong tinapon na oras. Uh, kahit 18 days lang tayo, sinubukan talaga natin mapag-aralan yung buong kampanya. Sinubukan natin na magbigay ng policy recommendations. Mira Sol Abogadil, UNTV News and Rescue. And that was the report of Mirasol Abugadil. Meanwhile, meanwhile, a motorcycle ride hailing service apologizes to the Transportation Department for violations of the guidelines on the pilot test run of motorcycle taxis. Angkas explains that they intend to cooperate with the government. Joa Nano tells us why. Following threats of the Department of Transportation Technical Working Group of possible blacklisting from the pilot test run on motorcycle taxis, Motorcycle Ride Hailing Service ANCAS apologized to the DOTRTWG and admitted its violation of the guidelines set by the government. ANCAS Chief Transport Advocate George Royeka emphasizes they are not attacking the government but instead they are just passionate to serve the riding public and that they want to provide livelihood to fellow Filipinos. Ako po humingi na po manhin sa LTFRD, sa DOTR. Sa nangyari po in the last few weeks, uh, marami pong back and forth doon. Kami po ay talagang ang bakay po natin is uh, makipag-kooperasyon sa mga regulators po natin para maging successful po ang ating pilota. Ang CAS also apologized for the alleged bullying on the DOTR TWG. But Alberto Swansing, a member of the TWG, seems to be unconvinced. Kung nag-sorry sila, that's uh, well taken. You know? They may call it whatever they want, you know? pero as far as we're concerned, that's bullying. Angkas vows not to charge surcharge beginning today. The motorcycle taxi firm also assures illegal operations of the riders outside the pilot test run area will not recur. Angkas explains what happened was merely a confusion with the existing ordinance on motorcycle taxis in Cagayan de Oro City. Isan kumuhugot ang local uh, government unit ano, ng uh, lakas para gawin nila yun. Uh, the law explicitly expressed na yung motorsiklo hindi dapat ginagamit sa public utility vehicle. As far as the local government is concerned, ang uh, teritory nila is yung tricycle. Although the government will consider the apology of Angkas, this doesn't mean the violations are taken for granted. Swan Singh reiterates that if Angkas is sincere in their apology, the DOTR will withdraw the cases filed in both Mandaluyong and Quezon City Regional Trial Courts. Joan Nano, UNTV News and Rescue, Makati City. In other news, President Rodrigo Duterte hits back at Vice President Lenny Robredo, saying that for the past year she has done nothing. He also calls her a colossal blunder. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. President Rodrigo Duterte was not able to resist mentioning even the vice presidential election's result in 2016 when asked about his reaction to the statements of Vice President Lenny Robredo against the anti-drug war. According to the president, for the past three years, the vice president has done nothing. You know, I hate to say this, but uh, how many voters are there in the Philippines? And uh, just... Uh, do away with the 200,000 plus that she got as a majority over Marco. It, it, it was a really a mistake. I mean, uh, with a slim margin, and you talk big, you know, for all of these years, she has done nothing. She is a colossal blunder. Colossal blunder. Blunder. In the report, the vice president released recently as the co-chairperson of the Interagency Committee on Anti-Illegal Drugs or ICAD for 18 days, she labeled the Duterte administration's drug war a failure. Based on the figure she mentioned, only 1% of the consumed shabu from 2016 to 2019 was seized by authorities. VP Robredo also said the ICAD chairmanship should be transferred from the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency to the Dangerous Drugs Board. But the president ignored the suggestion. Uh, if ever, 
kung sakali lang maging presidente siya, gawin niya yan. She does not lecture on me. I do not have the slightest as a lawyer lecturing on me well she should revisit her record i suggest rosa licoz untv news and rescue and for the news abroad here's stephanie c reporting live from hong kong stephanie good evening good evening william there were no survivors from the Ukraine International Airlines crash on Wednesday near Tehran, according to the official Iranian news agency IRNA. Around 170 to 180 people are estimated to have been traveling on the Boeing 737 plane bound for Kiev when it crashed after taking off from Imam Khomeini airport owing to technical failure. The aircraft's manufacturer, Boeing, has been facing a deep crisis following two accidents involving its flagship 737 MAX model, causing 346 deaths. The production of this model has been suspended. At least two air bases housing U.S. troops in Iraq have been hit by more than a dozen ballistic missiles in what appears to be the first retaliatory strike by Iran in the wake of the U.S. drone strike that killed Iranian Quds Force Commander General Qasem Soleimani last week in Baghdad. But U.S. President Donald Trump boasted on social media that the attack resulted in little damage and that he will address the nation on the issue. Beverly Saison has this story. President Donald Trump said on Tuesday that all is well following a retaliatory Iranian missile attack on U.S.-led forces and that he would make a statement on the situation on Wednesday morning. Iran said it had launched the missile attack on two Iraqi military bases hosting U.S.-led coalition personnel as retribution for the U.S. killing last week of Iranian military commander Qasem Soleimani. The Pentagon says at least two sites were attacked in Erbil and Al-Assad. It is unclear if there have been any casualties. Iran's Revolutionary Guard said the attack was in retaliation for the death of Soleimani on Friday. Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif later issued a statement on Twitter claiming the attack was self-defense and denied seeking to escalate the situation into war. The attacks took place hours after the burial of Soleimani. The second attack occurred in Erbil shortly after the first rockets hit al-Assad, al Mayadin TV said. Earlier in the day, President Trump said a U.S. withdrawal of troops from Iraq would be the worst thing for the country. Well, I think it's the worst thing that can happen to Iraq. If we leave, that would mean that uh, Iran would have a much bigger foothold and the people of Iraq do not want to see Iran running the, company, that, the country, that I can tell you. So I will say that we have had tremendous support from the people of Iraq appreciating what we've done and they don't want to see Iran go into Iraq. His comments came in the wake of the letter which the U.S. military said had been sent in error to Iraq's prime minister apparently agreeing to a request by Iraqi MPS to pull troops out. The U.S. has around 5,000 troops in Iraq. Beverly Saison, UNTV News and Rescue. Residents of the Afghan capital now have another cause for concern that has surpassed the war, the city's deteriorating air pollution that has reached hazardous levels in recent weeks. The situation poses a threat to the health of hundreds of thousands of people, particularly sensitive groups such as children and the elderly, many of whom have ended up in hospital. Katamaraos details this report. Seven-year-old Lita Jan started to complain of chest pain and sore throat with severe fever and headache after she went out of her room to play in the yard for a couple of hours. The girl was taken for treatment at Raman Mina Hospital in East Kabul on Wednesday. Lita is one of more than 130 patients who have been visiting the hospital on a daily basis for respiratory diseases such as bronchitis, pneumonia and flu, mainly brought on by the deteriorating air quality. The Afghan Ministry of Public Health said around 9,000 patients with pollution-related respiratory diseases visited 17 hospitals in Kabul in the last week of 2019, marking a 20% increase on the same period of last year. 
Dr. Niza Mudin Jalil, a spokesman for the health ministry, reported that the level of air pollution in the city in recent weeks reached hazardous levels, which is strongly unhealthy for the citizens. Children and elderly people with asthma, a history of heart problems, and weak immune systems are the main victims of air pollution. Strokes, serious heart problems, and cancer could be the long-term effects. Jalil strongly advises all citizens to remain indoors and wear masks if going outdoors for urgent needs, particularly in peak hours of pollution, which usually lasts from 4 p.m. until 12 a.m. The spike in air pollution has forced the authorities to launch a campaign to prevent the situation from getting worse. Public awareness programs, debates, preventive measures, including banning the burning of low-quality materials by businesses, are the immediate steps taken by the authorities to beat the pollution. Kat Numaraos, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you, Stephanie C., reporting live from Hong Kong. Some Filipinos in Sydney, Australia, consider moving to other states as massive bushfires in New South Wales continue. Meanwhile, authorities clarify the scale of the bushfires. Nina Bascon will tell us why. Sydney, Australia once again experienced toxic air quality this morning as the massive bushfires in New South Wales continue. Not only Sydney, but also other large cities like Canberra and Melbourne are affected by the worsening air quality. Because of this, some Filipinos in Sydney consider moving to other states, not severely affected by the bushfires. Might as well move to another state or move back to the Philippines. Kung lumalaman po ang sitwasyon, ang pinaplano po namin mag-anak ay baka pumunta po muna ng mga lugar na mas malapit po sa, sa East Coast ng pati ng Australia. Dahil lahat po ng uso po ng, ng bushfire ay karamihan yung nagagalik sa inner west or down south. Others are forced to wear face masks if they need to go outdoors. I'm wearing this mask to protect myself from haze because the city is really badly affected with the bushfire. And this is the first time that I experienced this really bad. The Australian Medical Association has warned the public against prolonged exposure to poor air as it may even get fatal for those who have pre-existing health conditions. Based on reports, the bushfire smoke has even reached South America. The damages caused by the bushfires in Australia is as wide as half size of the Philippine Luzon region. New South Wales is the worst hit state where almost 5 million hectares is affected by the fire. In Victoria State, around 800,000 hectares of land is scorched. While the 40,000 hectare Stirling Ranges in Western Australia, the richest biodiversity hotspot in the world, has also been burned. There are also incidents of bushfires in other states like South Australia, Queensland, and Tasmania. But recently, misleading maps and pictures of the scope of the bushfires in Australia have gone viral. The Australian authorities say those should not be shared as they misrepresent the scale of the fires. Nina Bascon, UNTV News and Rescue, Australia. And those are the reasons behind the news this January 8, 2020. On behalf of Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo. And before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. Pipilitin namin. Lalo na si Erat, pipilitin namin. Nagawa na namin ito kasi ayaw talaga nila umalis. Pero sana, ano sa amin? Pipilalika sa amin. Antal na makonvince namin. Because akala nila kasi, they don't know yet the difficulties kasi doon. Pero kung this is a force of equation, we have to force them really. Ang huling kapisa po nila ay uh, magmatsyag dito sa Sulaymania. Na kung may pagpabagong magaganap, i-report po agad sa kanila. Tapos yung katulad ng contingency plan nila nung nakaraan na uh, ISIS, uh, yung ulit ang gagawin. Sinuspindi na natin sila. So pinatawag natin sila at pinag-explain kung uh, anong nangyari. So inamin naman nila na hindi sila nakapag nakapagbigay ng monitoring report. And that's the reason why there was a disciplinary action imposed upon the agency. 
Ako po umingin ako manhin sa LTFRD, sa DOTR. Sa nangyari po in the last few weeks, uh, marami pong back and forth doon. Kami po ay talagang ang pakay po natin is uh, makipag-kooperasyon sa mga regulators po natin para maging successful po ang ating pilota. Kung nag-sorry sila, that's uh, well taken. No? They may call it whatever they want, no? pero as far as we're concerned, that's bullying. Kung lumalaman po ang sitwasyon, ang pinaplano po namin mag-anak ay baka pumunta po muna ng mga lugar na mas malapit po sa, sa East Coast ng party ng Australia. Dahil lahat po ng uso po ng, ng bushfire ay karamihan yung nagagalik sa inner west o down south.